All right, so we were talking uh, last time about covers, open covers, and finite subcovers. I said last time this has something to do with compactness. Open covers and finite subcovers. This does have something to do with compactness, and we'll get to that today. Um, we didn't really make it happen last time. Open covered and, and finite subcovers. Remember, an open cover of a set. So um, an open cover of some set A is a collection of open sets say I'll call them like O lambda which cover A which by which I mean A is a subset of the union of all these open sets all right it is a collection of open sets which cover the original set cover in the sense that A is a subset of their union. So for example, if I had something like A equals the closed interval from 0 to 10, then I could say call O n equals the interval uh, n minus 1 to n plus 1. This may be exactly an example we discussed last time. This would be an interval from 0 to 10, including the endpoints. That's my A, this original set. And then it is covered up by, in, by these intervals, O, N. So O, 0 would be uh, an open interval like this. This is O, 0. And then O, 1 goes from 0 to 2. This is O1. O2 goes from 1 to 3. That's O2, etc. You know, eventually you get the last one, which is, I guess, O10. All right, but anyway, those do cover the original set because the original set is a subset of all those things taken together. You can think of them as like little, little patches that do cover up the whole set. All right? Now, in this case, we only need finitely many of them. We only need O0 through O10, all right? Um, but this, you could say ON for all N in, uh, I mean, you could even take all N in the integers, like including the negative ones, and number zero, actually, we kind of do need number zero in this case, O0, just to get the, the last most uh, point. Anyway, this is an open cover. All right, and this one has what we call a finite subcover. That means even though there are infinitely many sets here, there's one for every integer, um, you, you don't need all of them in order to cover the set A. You only need uh, 10 of them or 11 of them, I guess, including the zero one. So this, for all N and Z, is an open cover. There is a finite subcover. That means you can still cover the thing only using finitely many of them, uh, which is O0, O1. You need O10 in order to cover the whole thing. All right, that's only got 11 of them, not infinitely many. So open covers. The question of whether or not an open cover has a finite subcover, that has a lot to do with compactness. It's a somewhat obscure and uh, it sounds strange, but uh, that has a lot to do with compactness. All right. Um, now, there was an example that I started talking about last time, and <laughs> somehow I thought that I had messed it up, but actually I hadn't. I didn't say anything wrong last time. I, don't, I, I just I got confused in my own mind. Um, so I, uh, here's another example. I will say this is a strange example. Check it out. Let's have A is just the open interval 0 to 1. You should see this in your notes from last time. And it can be covered by sets that look like OX is the interval, open interval from 0 to X. For X um, in 0, 1. So that means we take things, uh, if I were to draw a picture, it would look like, here's my original set, is an open interval like this not including the endpoints. And this is actually 
uncountably many sets, OX. You have like O a half, you also have O two thirds, but you also have, uh, for every X in the open interval, you also have irrational ones, uh, values for X, but basically they, all the OXs look like this. They have varying sizes of open intervals, right? Maybe this one right here is O one half. But um, I'm taking all possible real numbers down here between zero and one, all right? But this one might be, I tried to go almost all the way, 0.9, right? That's the, uh, the open interval from zero to 0.9, et cetera, all right? The only wrong thing I said last time, I think that I said, you could also look at 01, which covers the whole thing, all right? This though, I should have said, is not part of the cover. Check it out. I said only, I'm only considering OX where X is in the open interval zero to one. So there is no such, there is no such thing as O1, all right? Because X is not allowed to equal one over there. X is only in the open interval zero to one, but not including zero and not including one. So there is no O0, there's also no O1, but there is O everything else in between, all right? Uh, here's a question for you. This is why this is a strange example. If I use O1, it's not all that strange, but this is pretty strange because uh, do these things actually cover the whole set, even if I don't use O1? I think they do. This is the weird thing. Even though every individual one doesn't cover the whole set, but it is still true that any point in here eventually will be covered by one of these sets, right? Uh, you might wonder about what about the very last point, uh, one, but one is not supposed to be part of the set anyway, so you don't have to worry about covering one. Every other point eventually gets covered. So I'm gonna say O X for X in zero one is an open cover. Technically, I guess I should do that. I put set set thingies around that because I'm, an open cover consists of a, a collection of sets all together. So this is an open cover. of zero one. Does it have a finite sub cover? That is, is it possible to cover the whole thing only using finitely many of those little guys? I think the answer is no. If you only use finitely many, my question to you would be, well, how far up are you gonna go? How about I, I only use up to this one, 0.9. Well, then you, you didn't cover the whole thing, right? If you only use finitely many, it means that at some point you, you picked like a biggest one because say you use like seven different sets. What, what was the biggest one out of those seven? It's not gonna be big enough to cover the whole thing. So this is an open cover of zero one, but it has no finite sub cover. All right. You actually need all well, you don't need all of them, but you need infinitely many of them in order to cover the whole set. You cannot do it with only finitely many of them. All right, this is a strange example. All right, what if it was a closed interval, zero to one? Can I do the same thing? How about the closed interval, zero to one? Is it still true that there is no finite subcover in this case? I could say let O X be zero to X. Actually, the problem here for X in zero to one, uh, it's a closed interval this time. Does it have a finite sub cover this time? Uh, actually, you don't even get that far when you try to do the same example this way. Um, this, this isn't even a cover here. These sets do not cover the whole thing because they don't get None of those sets include zero, and also none of them includes one, right? So this actually, this OX is not an open cover. All right, you could, I, if you wanted to try to modify this to make it work on a closed interval, here I'm, I'm using A equals, sorry, I didn't write, I said it, but I didn't write it. A equals the closed interval zero to one. If you wanted to modify this to make it work for the close interval, one, one thing you could do is, well, maybe I'll just close all of these guys, then they would cover the whole thing. But it's supposed to be an open cover, not, it has to be an, a covering using open sets every time. And so that would not be allowed. You could, if you want to, 
call, uh, make the uh, make the starting point and ending point different. So this actually this is not an open cover, so that's not going to work at all. How about this? What if I said O X is maybe minus a half to X plus a half? That way they will stretch out a little bit over the left side, and they could also stretch out a little bit over the right side, and they would pick up those two points on the end. All right, I'm just trying to modify this to actually make it work. Again, for X in <coughs> zero one. All right. Does this have an open subcover? Let's see if I can draw this picture again. So, for example, uh, everything's crooked. Sorry. Um, if I were to draw, say, O point one, that would go from negative point negative a half all the way to 0.6, right? According to this formula right here. They all start on their left side at negative a half and they go up to whatever this 0.1 plus, plus a half. Um, so if I were to draw, you know, 0.2 would start at the same place but go a little bit further here. Does this have a finite sub cover? These will cl uh, cover the whole thing. Yes? Can anybody say which ones, which ones do I need to take to, to cover it? Only finally many of them. Saw some nodding. Do you have an idea? Yeah. As long as it's like the x is more than one half. Yes, right. So how about O point six? This would actually that by itself covers the whole thing, right? O point six, if I were to write out what it is, it's minus a half to point six plus a half, one point one. I hope you don't mind me mixing fractions and decimals. A little low, low class somehow, but uh, this covers the whole thing, right? So this covers all of A, all right? It's actually a fact that if you start with a closed interval, it is always possible to find a finite subcover, no matter what the original cover is. If it's a closed interval, you can always find a finite subcover. So this is a fact. All closed, uh, let me say, for any closed interval, for a closed interval, any open cover automatically has a finite subcover. But for an open interval, it's not necessarily true. This is a very, um, uh, I suppose strange and sophisticated way of thinking about open sets versus closed sets. But it's not actually about open sets and closed sets. Actually, this fact here is a very fundamental fact about compact sets. Remember, a compact set is closed and bounded. This fact, what I just wrote about the closed interval, is actually a major theorem, which I want to talk about today, which is about compact sets. So it's not just true of closed intervals. It's true of any compact set. And this has a name. This is called the... Heine Borel theorem. When I was in grad school, all my friends called it the Heine Borel theorem, which they thought sounded funny. They knew I was doing topology. Oh, you use the Heine Borel theorem? <laughs> it's not that funny. I say Heine. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a German name. The Heine Borel theorem. It says. This is the, fu the fundamental relationship between compact sets and this weird open cover, finite subcover thing. So it says, uh, it actually has three things, three different ways of describing compact sets. So the way that this is typically written is, I will say, the following are equivalent. There are three separate descriptions of compact sets. So first of all, I will say A, a set, is compact. Remember what that means is that every, um, every sequence in A has a convergent subsequence and it converges to a point of A, all right? A is compact. It is equivalent to saying A is closed and bounded. This we already talked about, but this is often included as part of the Heine-Borel theorem, is that a compact set 
A is compact if and only if it is closed and bounded. Those are, those are equivalent. Saying something's compact is the same as closed and bounded. And these two things are also equivalent to this thing about open covers. It says if, uh, well, I'll just write any open cover of A has a finite subcover. This is the Heine Borel theorem. All right? So, when your friends ask you, you know, what, is, what does compact mean? One way to answer is it means uh, that the set is closed and bounded, which they will, that sounds more or less intelligible. Or you could say another way to answer it means that any open cover has a finite subcover, which is much more. Um, much more far out and uh, more sophisticated way of thinking about compactness is about these open covers and finite subcovers. All right, I would like to talk about some of this. I don't want to do the complete proof of this, but for the sake of talking about these three parts, can I give these numbers? Let's say this is number one, number two, number three. All right, now we already talked about like two times ago the fact that one and two are equivalent, and you should have used that on your homework when it, you know, homework says some, some stuff about is this set compact or not? The easiest way is to think about it in terms of closed and bounded. Usually that's the way to think about compact sets. Um, so I will just say we already saw that um, one is equivalent to two, right? Compact, we already know, is the same as closed and bounded. What I want to talk about is why is it true that closed and bounded is the same as this finite cover, open, open cover, finite subcover thing. So we'll discuss uh, two if and only if three, all right? Um, and actually, part of this we've already talked about too. So let's let's talk a little bit about two implies three. No? Two implies three. All right. Can we discuss this? So I'm gonna say assume A is closed and bounded. Is this? Sorry, I I want to start it with the other way around. Three implies two. Sorry about that. We'll we'll talk about both eventually. But. Uh, so I assume three. Assume any cover, any open cover has a finite subcover. What does that have to do with closed and bounded? That's what I want to talk about. Assume any open cover has a finite subcover. All right, then we want to, uh, I say I want to show A is closed and bounded. Right. Some of this we've already discussed. Let's talk about bounded first of all. That's the easier one. If any open cover has a finite subcover, that means it has to be bounded. This is because um, if the set is unbounded, we we talked about this last time. If the set is unbounded, then you can actually just like put a little interval uh, around every point, and then. Since it's unbounded, you have to use infinitely many of those little intervals to cover the whole thing because the set goes on forever. You have to use uh, infinitely many of them. So to say it's bounded, really what I just explained is the contrapositive. I will say if A is unbounded, then cover A with, I will say, small neighborhoods of every point. So for instance, if A looks like, say, the natural numbers, which, I mean, maybe it has some interval parts to it. But I'm just saying, well, if, it, if it's really unbounded and goes on forever, and I decide to make my open cover look like this, if it's unbounded, then you can't possibly cover this with only finally many of those little neighborhoods, right? Because the original set goes on forever, I'm going to have to basically just I'm going to have to use all of these if I want to still cover the whole set because it goes on forever. All right, so if A is unbounded, then cover A with small neighborhoods of every point. This has no finite subcover. All 
right? So what I just argued was unbounded implies no finite subcover. The contraposite of that would be if, if there is a finite subcover, then it is bounded, which is what I was trying to explain right here, all right? So if every cover has a finite subcover, it is bounded, all right? What about the closed bit? The closed is about limit points. We have to explain why every limit point is part of the set. This I'm also gonna sort of draw a picture. So closed, I have to say something like let X be a limit point of A. Did I say my set is called A? Yeah. Uh, and then we have to explain why I want to show that actually X is in A. That's what it means to be closed, right? That every limit point is contained in the set. So I choose some limit point of A and I want to show that X is in A. All right, um, what this means, the picture here would be, I have, you know, maybe my set has a bunch of values which approach some point here and here is X. That's a limit point, right? That's what a limit point looks like. And I want to show that that last point actually needs to be in the original set. Um, and we have to somehow show this by using uh, covers and subcovers, right? It, to show that ev we use the fact that every open cover has a finite subcover. And the way that I would do this is um, if uh, I would do a similar thing again. So make an open cover by choosing little neighborhoods around all these points. Small neighborhoods around these points. Right, so I, I put a little one there, a little one here, a little something like this, right? Eventually, every little point gets its own little interval. Now, if X is in the original set, then it, it's going to get caught because I'm going to put a little interval around X, right? I'm going to make an open cover with small neighborhoods around these points. Um, I think actually a better way to think about this is in terms of uh, to get a contradiction. How about this? For the sake of a contradiction, assume that X is not in there. All right, that means I can make this little covering uh, with little neighborhoods that always avoid X, all right? We make an open cover with small neighborhoods around these points. Uh, for the sake of a contradiction, I assume X is not an A and make the neighborhoods, you just make them small enough every time so that they, so that they miss that point X. Right. Uh, but this is also a problem in terms of finite subcovers. If I make these neighborhoods so small that they are missing uh, all of these points, then um, there's not, you're not going to be able to uh, cover these with only finally, finitely many of those little neighborhoods. All right? The only way that it could work using only finitely many is if these piled up at X, and then I could put one of my neighborhoods around X, which would catch infinitely many of the other points. But if X is not part of the set, then I can make the neighborhood so small that no single neighborhood ca catches infinitely many of the other points. All right, this is the idea. So you make an open cover with small neighborhoods around these points, each, each neighborhood around one point, excluding all the other ones. And uh, you make them small enough to miss X, and then there will be no finite subcover, which is a contradiction. This contradicts our you know, assumption that we assumed that there always was going to be a finite subcover. All right? This is why you need, X needs to be part of the set. See, if X really was part of the set, I could take one of my neighborhoods around X, 
which would automatically cover infinitely many of the other points, and then you would get a finite subcover, but you don't in this in this case. All right. Excellent. I think I think that is going to do for our discussion of this. So th I've only discussed like a, a part of this Heine-Borel theorem. The the two implies three. And I, I didn't give the complete details, you know, looking at the pictures. The other way around is basically the same kinds of pictures to, um, to show that uh, 3 implies 2. So can I just say, sorry, 3 implies 2 is what we just did. 2 implies 3 is similar reasoning, but I don't want to spend all day doing these proofs. So uh, would you mind if we leave it at that? So can I say 2 implies 3? How about is in the book if you really want to check it out? All right. But I hope this, both of these pictures really should give you an idea of the, the connection between boundedness and open covers and also closed, closedness and open covers, all right? And finite subcovers. Any thoughts about that? Great. Um, let's, oh yeah, I, I thought I would share with you one more, I don't know if you remember, two days ago maybe, we start, I started off with some comp questions, old comp questions about compact sets. Um, there was one other part of that question which I didn't tell you at that time. Um, this was a, another easy uh, comp question about compact sets. This actually is very easy given what we've done so far. It said prove using the heine borel theorem that um, Z is not compact, right? Hein so heine borel means compactness is the same as closed and bounded, and it's also the same as that thing about open covers. So it's up to you to decide when it says using heine borel that means you should think of compactness in terms of closed and bounded, or maybe in terms of open covers. And it's up to you in this case um, is it easier, uh, well, show that Z is not compact. You can either think of this in terms of closed and bounded or open covers. I said this was an easy one. Anybody feel like this is an easy one? Yes? How would you say Z is not compact? It's not bounded. It's not bounded. Yeah. So it's not closed and bounded. So the first part of the heine borel actually you don't need the part of the heine borel about open covers. Although it is possible to prove directly that any, any open cover of Z has a finite subcover. Uh, has no that there are open covers of Z with no finite subcover, but don't don't try it that way. That's harder. Um, so my proof would be, yeah, uh, just what she said. Z is not bounded. That's it, really. So if you want to, I mean, if you want to mention the Heine Borel specifically, I would say so. Z is not closed and bounded. So uh, by Heine Borel, Z is not compact. All right. I had a professor in grad school who, who told us this this story. I don't I don't know if this is a true story. He he claims that this is a true story. He was um, he was at a protest during the Vietnam War and he was carrying a sign that said Mathematicians for Peace. And somebody walked up to him and said uh, he was like with some uh, some friends, and someone walked up to them and said, "You guys are really mathematicians?" And they said, "Yeah." And he said, "Oh yeah, what's the Heine Borel theorem?" And he said, "It said uh, compact sets are closed and bounded and have the finite subcovers." And the guy was like, "Huh? Eh? All right." So <laughs> that's that's what that's what it takes to prove to a man on the street that you are a real mathematician. You know the Heine Borel theorem. All right. This is all I wanted to say about compact sets. So they, the, the standard way, uh, the, your go-to way of thinking about compact sets should be they are closed and bounded. That's usually the, the easier way to think of it. They are also sets for which any open cover has a finite subcover, right? Great. We have 19 minutes remaining. In our remaining 19 minutes, I would like to talk about connected sets. That was the last sort of C word that I was talking about 
what are the important properties of a closed interval? No, they weren't all C words. A closed interval is closed. It's also bounded. That means it's compact. And then the other important thing about intervals is they are connected. This is, unlike compactness, this is a much more sort of intuitively obvious notion. Connected sets, although the definition of a connected set is another one of these fairly non-obvious definitions. If you try to think about what exactly it means, what exactly you mean when you say a set is connected, it's not easy at all to write down a real definition for that. Uh, so what it means, I will say informally speaking, a set is connected when it's, I would say, like all in one piece or something like that. It's not like in two pieces. So for example, uh, a closed interval from A to B is connected because it's like, it's like right there, right? Or, uh, or an open interval is also connected. Whether you have the endpoints on it or not, it doesn't matter. It's all like one thing. Right? These are connected. What's a disconnected? It would be something like two intervals, the union of two intervals that are not, you know, touching each other. Something like one, two, union, three, four. So this looks like, sorry, I'm, I'm being inconsistent with my colors, but this looks like that, right? This is disconnected because it's like in two pieces. All right, or something like, I mean, it's, it's not just intervals that we discuss in terms of connectedness. It could be something like one over n, right? That's disconnected because these are points which go like this, approaching zero, right? That's disconnected. What if we do one over n union zero, like add in the point at the end? union zero, then it looks like this, a bunch of points, but then I, I also include the thing that they, that they actually approach. Is that connected or not? No, it's not. Actually, this is sort of a red herring. The, whether I include that point or not is not relevant. It's, I still have infinitely many like isolated points. They are not all connected together in, uh, in things that look like intervals. So this also, disconnected. Anyone want to give a stab at a definition for connected? The best way to say, you know, informally is like all the things that they, they're all just like in one, one chunk, one piece, one nugget. Were you going to use the word nugget? No. All right. You can make like Something about neighborhoods? Actually, I, the definition that we're going to say does not involve neighborhoods, not, not per se. Although, you, maybe you could. Although, I'm not sure what, um, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what you would say about neighborhoods. You got an idea? Completeness. I don't know. A lot of the ideas that come to my mind are like, if you have a bunch of points, maybe I end up think, saying things like, if I have a bunch of points that approach something, then that something is really there. It's not like there's no big gap in the middle. But that's really what I just said is the definition of a closed set, that like the limit point is actually part of the set. Right? So that you don't want to say that exactly. Any, any other ideas? So there, I have two ways of making a real definition about connectedness. Oh, I, I meant to mention one, one last uh, interesting example. Q. You gotta talk about Q, right? So Q would be just like a whole lot of points. Is that connected or disconnected? Uh, the answer is disconnected, yeah. Um, even though these points, they're all kind of like arbitrarily close to each other, and it's like every, every uh, epsilon neighborhood around one of these points contains infinitely many other points in the set, it's still disconnected though. This is disconnected. All right, so I have two ways of making this uh, definition. One is 
is maybe makes more sense but is much harder to use. The other one is more complicated but is much easier to use. So let's talk about the easy first definition. I got two definitions, right? And uh, tomorrow we'll talk about why they are equivalent, although two definitions, they are equivalent. Um, one, like I said, one is easy to understand but hard to use. So let's do that one first. Easy to understand. Hard to use. Um, this is about, this I would say is based on betweens. It basically, uh, what I'm going to say is a set is connected. I almost said compact, but I said connected. A set is connected if, whenever you have two points in that set, all the points in between are also in that set. That's a good way to say it's connected, if you think about it. Whenever two points are in the set, all the in-between points are also part of the set. So that's what this first definition is. So it says, now our book for a connected set, they use the letter E. So E, a subset of R, is connected. Means if A less than B, and A and B are in E. It's complicated to write, but it's a very natural idea, I think. And C is in between A and B. Then C is in E. All right. That kind of looks like a lot of nonsense, but when you draw the picture, what I'm talking about is my set is connected. It means if A is in here and B is in here somewhere else and C is in the middle, then C is also part of the set. It basically means if you have any two numbers in the set, there is no gap in between them. There's no like hole in the set in between them because every number in between them is automatically has to be part of the set, all right? This is one way of saying that a, uh, that a set is connected. I said this one is easy to understand. I hope you agree that the, 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 form the formalism here is a little complicated, but it's very easy to understand, I think. Um, but it's actually hard to use. The fact that this is so complicated makes it very hard to like prove that some set or another is connected. It's quite a bit easier, so I'm going to tell you my other definition. This I'm going to like label as, as if it were the true definition of connectedness, because this is the one we're actually going to use. Um, the true definition of connectedness. And this is the one that's not an obvious idea at all. We define what it means to be disconnected and then connected just means the opposite of this. So we define E is disconnected when, what does disconnected mean? It means basically you can separate it into two, two chunks or two nuggets, two pieces, which don't overlap one another. That means that it's disconnected. All right, so I'm gonna write it like this. E is disconnected when we can write Something like E is A union B. We can separate it into two parts. Such that, really I wanna say there's no overlap between those two parts. Although just saying there's no overlap is not good enough. What we have to say is this. And this is the extra non-obvious part. A closure intersect B is Sorry, is the empty set, and A intersect B closure is the empty set. This is weird and not obvious, but um, without those closures, it would just say A intersect B is, not, is the empty set. That just means A and B have no overlap, which is basically what I want to say. Although you do need these closures to avoid some special weirdness, all right? Uh, and here, let me just say uh, some, some uh, terminology here. Um, each of A and B, when you do this, these are called, you know, I've been referring to them as chunks or nuggets. That's not the technical term. These are called um, components. That is two pieces of the set. 
Um, and when I write sort of E is A union B, where those are the two pieces, this, this sort of little sentence, if you will, E equals A union B, this is called a separation of E, right? So if there is a separation, then E is disconnected. And what is connected means? It connected means there is no possible separation. It's just the opposite of disconnected. All right, so all of that means disconnected. Let me just say, I should write it down. E is connected when there is no separation. Right? That is, it is impossible to write E as a union of two sets where the closure of one does not intersect with the other. All right. um, can we talk a little bit about, so this definition I don't, looks kind of complicated, but actually this is very easy to use. For example, uh, let's just do a bunch of simple examples. Is it connected or not? Well, really all of these examples are gonna be disconnected. How about this, zero, one, union, three, four. Connected or disconnected? The answer is disconnected. This looks like this, right? An open interval and then another open interval, right? That's disconnected. This is disconnected. Because we can make a separation One is very obvious. What should I choose for the A and the B? People are doing this. This is the Steve Sawin rap, rap move. He does this in that video. <laughs> um, yes, uh, just those two sets are the A and the B, right? They are separated apart. A is zero to one, B is three to four. And then can we actually prove that the closure of the one intersect with the other one is empty. Is that true? A closure intersect B. What is that? The closure of A, well, since A is an open interval, the closure is just that same interval, but we include the endpoints. So that would be the closed interval zero to one, intersect the open interval three to four. And what is this intersection? I believe it is the empty set. Those are two intervals that are apart, right? They don't, they don't have any points in common. So this really is the empty set. And we have to also have to check that this one is the empty set. You have to check both, but I mean, it is. So this way around would be the open interval zero to one intersect the closed interval three to four. And again, this is the empty set. All right, because there are no <coughs> numbers that are in both of those intervals. So I have demonstrated that this is disconnected. This one was obvious what the separation should be just because I already see the two uh, sets there. All right, let's try some a little less obvious. I got two more examples. Uh, how about um, E equals R minus zero. This is the entire real line except for the number zero, everything else. All right, can we make a separation of that? It is disconnected, first of all, it is. The, even though there's only one point missing there, that still counts as disconnecting, all right? So um, it is disconnected. This is what we're going to demonstrate by finding a separation. Anyone uh, wanna suggest, what, what should I use for A and B here? Disconnected means it falls into two pieces, at least two pieces. What are the two pieces? Yeah. Uh huh. And zero to infinity. Yeah, this is the way that you should just by looking at the picture. I mean, most of these examples, I would suggest, if it's not given to you already, try to draw a picture of it and then find two things that disconnect it. All right. Um, and now we need to verify again that those closures and intersections work out properly. So A closure intersect B would be minus infinity to zero closure intersects zero to infinity. What is minus infinity to zero, the closure? 
Huh? Yeah, right. Minus infinity to zero, but it's like that. Should I put the bracket on the other side too? No, because that don't make no sense. Uh, there is no such thing as closed on the infinity side. All right, and then intersect. Open interval zero to infinity. And is that the empty set? Uh, it is. You should be worried about the number zero. Isn't the number zero in both of these? Actually, no, it's not. It's only in the, the one on the left, right? We got close there, but not quite. So there are no numbers in both of those. So, and, and the same goes the other way around, right? A intersect B closure. This would be minus infinity zero intersect the closed interval zero to infinity. But again, this is the empty set because zero is not in both of those. It's only in one of them. All right. I said I had two more. Let's just do one more. This is the most interesting of the examples. How about Q? So I have points all over the place. Dense, densely packed. Everybody said before, and I said, Q is disconnected. So can we find a separation? We need to somehow split the whole thing into two separate sets. You got an idea? I like this idea. Yeah. He says A is negative infinity to pi. Close interval or open? Open. I agree. When you're making these sets, they could be anything. You know, they could be closed intervals, they could be open intervals, they could be cantor sets if you want. You basically should never do that, but they can be any set. And then he said pi to infinity. Anybody agree that these actually cover up the whole set? Yeah, now one, one thing that, that concerns me is they miss pi, right? Like pi is not covered by these two sets. But actually that's okay because I'm trying to cover up q, which doesn't have pi anyway, so that's all right. But um, one thing that concerns me is right here, E equals A union B. That is not quite true of those sets. Because these sets, A union B is actually all of R, apart from pi. But I want, I want to get only rationals. There's actually a, maybe not obvious, but simple way you can fix that. Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Yes, I want all, this interval, but only the rationals in this interval, not all the real numbers, only the rationals. And then when I, when I union them, I actually do get exactly Q, not something bigger. The easiest way to do that is just this, right? And now those two things, it is true that A union B equals all of Q. All right, can we just, real quick, can we verify this business? A, bar intersect B. What is the closure of A? Well, it's this real interval, but only the rationals. But when I take the closure, that's going to insert all the reals also, because the rationals are dense inside the reals. Taking the closure will throw in all the reals also. This maybe is not entirely obvious, but because the time is up, this is that set. It's closed on pi because I took the closure. You should start to worry. Now I'm actually including the number pi. Don't worry, it's fine. Uh, it intersect, sorry, not union. Intersect B, which is pi to infinity intersect Q. And that is empty, right? Because this is all the numbers less than pi. This is all the numbers more than pi. There is no, uh, nothing in both of those sets. The intersection of Q has no effect here. And then similarly, a intersect B bar is minus infinity to pi intersect Q, intersect pi to infinity like that. And again, this is the empty set. All right, that'll do for today, I think. Check out the homework. We got homework for tomorrow.